like to do a presentation, that would be great. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, the Liquor Control Licensing Act was amended this year to permit uh, theaters to license as uh, alcoholic beverage serving establishments. They have basically two models. Uh, one model is where you've got a separate lounge area where uh, those over the age of 19 can uh, attend and uh, be served alcoholic beverages. The other model is where the alcoholic beverages are generally uh, served in the seating area of the theater. Um, for those of you who know Roxy Theater, it's a very small lobby. It's impractical for them just to run a, a lounge area into a small lobby. So they are applying for the whole theater to be licensed for the service of alcoholic beverages, which means in the event that they do such uh, service, only those who are 19 and over can attend the theater, so minors would be excluded. Um, generally speaking, they would have to uh, put their license in advance to have events where there were uh, uh, minors not present, that sort of thing. Uh, the application uh, contemplates a service seven days a week uh, between the hours of 5 p.m. and 12 midnight on every day but Friday and Saturday, at 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday evenings with the proviso that liquor service still be permitted one hour before a screening and one hour after a screening. A staff's uh, technical review uh, indicates no objections uh, from other departments within the city and we're prepared to recommend this be advanced to a public hearing so that the public can comment on the application and then the council can make a decision based upon both the technical review and the public input. Thank you. Uh, Charlene Gordon Jill and then Council Ryan. So my first question is just the clarification. If a regular movie night will not be, this will be a set of uh, regular movie night. This is mainly for special events that uh, would have overnight. Uh, I don't know what their actual business model is. Um, whether they plan simply to be a movie house that only uh, serves uh, alcoholic beverages for those who are 19 and over, or where they plan to have general admission nights or, or in conjunction with special events. So they would say it is movie nice to see hotel, that's better, but only people over 19 can go to it. When they, when they want to serve alcoholic beverages, it's 19 and over, and then if they uh, are not doing that general admission, and my second question is restaurants. Uh, I don't know if they're uh, still or expected to, but they, many restaurants have uh, ensured their staff have served the right, uh, and, and the manager has to serve the right to the no matter any certain provision that staff has such a, the same would have that serve the right. All beverage alcohol service personnel in BC must have That's that designation for either a restaurant or a bar. So it doesn't matter. So it would be okay. Um, and then uh, I'm interested in hearing my, my colleagues uh, comment on, uh, since we do have an establishment uh, in that same neighborhood that has to close at midnight, I just want to know why we have two exceptions to one o'clock for this one on weekend um, to be consistent, but I hear what my other colleagues have to say. Councillor Adams. I support the recommendation. I'd be happy to do it one at a time. Seems appropriate. I think a public hearing is the best way to hear from one community whether this is supportable in the community. Um, I'm a liaison to the neighborhood, and I understand that the applicant has been in touch with the neighborhood association for the past six months. Uh, I would. I think it might be good to have a bit of a delay between the public hearing, even by one meeting, and consideration of an actual recommendation to allow for some flexibility. Uh, I have some questions I'd like to ask the applicant the public hearing around what provision there would be for all ages um, movie nights. Because my understanding is they would be looking for at least some of their showings to serving uh, alcohol concurrently in the theater. That could preclude young people and minors from attending. So I think this is, since it is somewhat distinct from our land use procedures and there is perhaps some room for improvising and perhaps proposing the applicant measure request in a certain direction, I think it would be prudent to not have to make a decision place, but I think this is the best way to hear what the public wants and whether it's affordable. And uh, Your Worship, just to, to acknowledge uh, Councillor Eisen's remark, and uh, we were contemplating uh, that approach. Uh, Mark Hayden now in bylaw licensing services is working on the licensing reports, 
and uh, have imposed that as the, uh, the method for this particular. Thank you. I have a comment on that one. It's my turn, but I have helps in my turn. Um, I'm happy to put the motion on the table for discussion, and I would really like to hear from the public on this. And I take uh, Councillor Thornton Doe's question about um, midnight closing, if that's more appropriate. And the question to Mr. Woodland should we hear overwhelmingly from the public that, yeah, this is a good idea, but could it close at midnight? Is that something that could be incorporated into our recommendation after the public hearing? Yes, um, though, as uh, you may want to uh, get the, uh, the business owners to uh, respond to that, that's that contemplated. Thank you. So the motion's on the table. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wooden, the question is, how is it that, uh, like at Save One Cruz Arena, in a hockey game, that you can make up a beer and go sit in the stands if you get next to you, the team, you can't do it in the uh, Stadium have a different set of terms and conditions on the license. Theaters have never been licensed for beverage alcohol service, movie theaters. Um, they're distinct from uh, live performance theaters, such as the Royal Theater. And uh, stadiums fall into the live performance category. I think historically it was an, an issue both with competition uh, with other uh, service providers and the notion of the uh, all ages nature of the theater. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess for me, one of the suggestions that I would actually like to put forward is uh, I think it would be a great use for this table to generate a list of questions that we could then get answered <coughs> for the applicant, which would then inform the public hearing so the public could actually come forward and comment on that. Obviously, some of the comments might be uh, favored by which time to close, would you do it, would you business model, uh, all of these sort of things. So rather than have a public hearing, answer a bunch of questions, have them come back to us, but then either have another public hearing now the public is going to comment on what we know and they don't. Um, I think it would probably be more prudent to actually ask all the questions ahead of time. Um, so both we and the public have them in mind as we move forward to uh, the public hearing. Um, and certainly after the public hearing, we've pointed out three or four weeks before we adopt, um, just allow for that opportunity for more sober assessment to come from better term. Um, but I, I still think that a lot of what we, we may hear as a public that they're going to want to hear those answers first um, on that. The second issue I have, um, and I need to confirm with Mr. Woodland, is if we grant this license uh, and it is accepted by the province, it runs with the land, right? It doesn't run with the person. Uh, it runs. The, the, the license is held by the licensee. So if the owner uh, sold, his business to another owner, that person could acquire the license through the transfer of the business. Uh, does it run with the land specifically? Uh, it is attached to this particular address. If it was to be moved, there would be a process triggered uh, related to its movement and approvals by the licensing branch, possibly with the input of a relevant local government. If it's in the city of Victoria, we may have a role in commenting on the proposed location. If it moves to an adjacent municipality, we would not. I guess my thought is this. I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I know the owner and respect the owner. Um, the question I have is <coughs> what prevents... I, I worried a little bit about late night movies with alcohol uh, and only 19 and over. Like it really has, does have the potential in the wrong operator's hand to become a community maker. So I'm trying to think, how do we prevent that from happening without turning the whole thing down? Uh, that's an issue. I can see it quite easily becoming an issue, um, intentionally or unintentionally. So um, those are my concerns. Um, we now have Councillor Gudgeon and Councillor Cole. I'm in favor of the, uh, well, I, I need some questions of moving it to public hearing, but I have some real big concerns that it's 350 seats, but not 250 seats, Mr. Four hundred forty. Four hundred forty. Okay, that's terrifying. Four hundred forty-six. But that in itself would be enough for me to say no without having a model that's. I mean, they can just tear that down and build a 447 seat liquor primary. That's absolutely. Is that correct? 
Uh, well, I don't think it No, is. that's not correct. Uh, this is a specific uh, license that is for a theater. But they could they have... rebuilt a theater there, presumably, and they'd be able to do that. They would not be able to... It wouldn't uh, be a pro later primary license no. that could be no. transferred to another use. It not without amending the terms and conditions of the license. So those would be... Are, and we're putting those terms and conditions now? We're, we're making those terms? No, the liquor control licensing grant sets all the conditions of the license. In this particular case, it's a liquor primary license that is specific to a movie theater. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Colvin Polo. Thank you, Rick. This is uh, an evolutionary stage. Vancouver has an application, hasn't been uh, accepted. This isn't the first one off in BC when it was then it is. Uh, it's a follow up on what's being Yes. Established in Vancouver, and so it would be useful to understand the impact there, um, and perhaps other Canadian jurisdictions if that follows. But particularly the Vancouver model is what this is based on. So I, I think it's a, an interesting opportunity. I would like to hear from the public on it, but I would also like to understand what the rationale is or how it's been embedded in Vancouver. Um, Do you think it's gone through the identical process in Vancouver and it's been approved? I'll vote then. Yeah. I also think it would be interesting to hear the public, so I'm in favor of sending to a public hearing, but my question is, is it possible, do we have the authority to grant a license that is limited to like, the current licensee? Uh, the City of Victoria doesn't grant the license. All I do is provide input to the uh, general manager of the control licensing branch. If you wanted to express concerns about subsequent transfer, Concerns regarding conversion to another type of license, such as just a bar license. Um, so certainly, you can express those concerns, and they would, you know, take those into account. You know, some of them might be relevant, some of them might not be relevant, but you're expressing your views. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I share some of the concerns expressed, and. I'm kind of inclined to be a little cautious initially and, and wonder if uh, I'd be more comfortable having it go forward with, for example, um, the end of service being an hour before the screening, the end of the screen. We've already said that they don't have room in their lobby uh, for people like that. I mean, the main impact is going to be people emerging from the theater, walking through the But we know that if people come out of events where they've been drinking, they can be a little noisy. Um, my inclination would be to set rather early hours, uh, certainly no later than the Fifth Street Bar and Grill, for example, or maybe earlier. And as I say, restricted even to uh, stopping uh, serving uh, before the end of the film, rather than after. Um, we can always expand it later. It's uh, if everything goes smoothly. It seems as if it's harder to uh, remove privileges once around it and to expand. Thank you. Um, I think that's it the speaker. So perhaps now is time to craft a motion. Um, Councilor John, I think I saw enough hands nodding in your idea. Yes. The motion's already on the table. Oh, is it on the table? Councilor Young, if that would be appropriate for you to put an amendment to see if that would support it. Well, I, I moved an amendment um, to uh, have service uh, stop, uh, what should we say, one hour before, one hour before, hour before the end of the screening? Or, or, uh, or Um, if, if council is mindful to consider an amendment to that effect, I would just ask that um, you allow staff to check on our enforceability of that relative to what the liquor licensing act says. Um, 
so that we don't um, convene a public hearing and try to do something that's not permitted under the Act. So I just want to verify that the liquor general manager of the licensing branch could consider a recommendation from the local government to that effect that doesn't conflict with their legislation. Because I, I just don't want to convene a public hearing saying that we're planning to do X if X isn't permitted because I think that will confuse the public hearing. So um, perhaps just uh, when we settle out as to what it is uh, council's prepared to support that uh, we just make the public hearing subject to confirmation from the general manager of the micro licensing branch that the, you know, the proposed amendment is uh, not lawful. Perhaps if I can make this recommendation then, Mr. Woodland, is that we move forward with Council Young's amendment to now and when this shows up at a council meeting, that you may be able to provide that when it comes to the council meeting and amend it appropriately at that time. Um, I wouldn't want to do that, Your Worship, because you would be faced with the prospect of uh, potentially having a public hearing saying we're going to cut it off at 10.30 at night and I come to the public hearing and say that's not permitted and you're left dealing with the application of midnight or 1 a.m. I'm trying to craft something that you didn't quite understand. This recommendation, whatever comes off of this one, will go forward to each meeting before we move to. So it's got to go to the council to actually have the motion to the right TPC. So I thought we could probably get that answer within a period that allows us to move the appropriate motion uh, if we had to be word at the next council meeting. Okay. So with that, uh, let's just have the motion that it, uh, move, it ends an hour before the end of the show time or event.
subject to certain matter privilege is uh, provided for uh, go in camera under our bylaw under section 12 of uh, sub 3 G. Um, and in short, we're actually keeping the license for all of this at this point. Well, uh, I guess I, I, I did try and give a bit of a heads up earlier today. I guess the question is first of all, um, I'm assuming there will be advice that you will give us with regard to the motion that's been put forward. But I take it you're also giving advice on litigation that the city is or may be involved in. That's correct. Um, okay. Um, is any of the litigation on which you're giving advice um, uh, the litigation the procedures and um, uh, concerns, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly whether it's actually a legal matter or, a, or a, um, a, some kind of um, mediation process connected with um, the FOI, uh, the uh, uh, staff's decision that we were given earlier to Request that we not be required to provide uh, FOI information to uh, focus on that. Uh, Your Worship, I don't believe that it's appropriate for me to answer that question because the, the answer in itself would constitute a waiver or disclosure of privileged information. I think that the council should know that it is permissible for council to go and us whether or not to go with camera so that you can receive this information, decide then whether to go with camera and then either come back to the public meeting or, or not. Um, but the, the, it, it's, it's difficult for me to provide you with uh, information about what it is that we're, we're going to provide advice on without actually revealing what it is. Well, well I'm prepared to support motion to go in camera to hear advice on whether we should go in camera. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. Um, we have not yet actually brought up before. Um, <coughs> we will, however, we'll proceed with item number 7A, uh, which is a motion to amend the Freedom of Information Bond. Dr. Ellis. Sure. I'll put the table or put the motion on the table for discussion. Um, this motion comes out of uh, a response, a loud response, I feel, from the public um, about a decision that was made. Uh, earlier in the summer dealing with section <coughs> requests. And while I strongly support the intention of the Freedom of Information Act and our Freedom of Information Bylaw, and every other Freedom of Information Bylaw and every other local government in the province, which I've surveyed this week, not all of them, but the ones that I have, do keep councils at arm's length and for very good reason. However, I think that um, there's been an unprecedented um, action that the City of Victoria in terms of Section 43 for the media and in the years since the FOI Act was passed that hasn't happened in any other instance and I think that it's uh, worth our while to at least put a provision in our bylaw to just give council the opportunity, councils of the future, an opportunity that when staff as the administrators of the Act are going to make a Section 43 um, request to the Privacy Commissioner that we have a presentation and an opportunity to weigh in on that because as we've seen there are really big political consequences uh, and I think for this reason that um, 
this is something we should do, amend our bylaw, because I, I really strongly think that it will not be misused by councils because of the political consequences of keeping um, the public closed out of important discussions. So I would urge us to support this motion. I think that we are working on open and transparent governance, and I think that in this in this key instance, it doesn't hurt council to just add that into our bylaw. Should it Thank you, Councillor Young, Councillor Rice. Um, yeah, your worship, I, I, I will um, I will support the motion. I obviously I I do have a concern that that has been expressed that council should not be interfering with the FOI uh, process, and I suspect that the legislation was written to prohibit from councils. Encourage staff to um, have staff placed in charge of this process was to prevent councils from unduly preventing the release of information uh, for political purposes. Now, <coughs> now we we have the situation where uh, staff has been concerned about the workload issues and, and the cost of of meeting requests, and uh, we find ourselves in the position that we would like to say, well, we actually think that we're prepared to bear those costs because it's important that the public have access to that information. I would certainly prefer it if we had some kind of asymmetrical situation where um, the staff would make the first, um, the first judgment and if uh, the staff were proposing a restriction for some reason on the release of information, uh, decision would then be put uh, up to council, which as Councillor Kelp says, would be making a decision on, uh, in public and under public scrutiny and uh, would then make a decision as to whether they wish the information withheld. So I'm, I, I don't pretend to um, be an expert in this, uh, in this legislation that impact of this would be certainly uh, my intent or the intent that I, I think we're looking for and which I'm supporting is that uh, uh, council will have the opportunity to say uh, no despite the cost uh, we do think that information should be made available and um, I'm assuming this is the best way to go about doing it if there is a, if there is a better way than Thank you, and again, um, perhaps what would be useful, I think it needs to be clarified, what is the actual recommendation that has gone forward, I've just heard again, that for preventing information, and my understanding is that is the scope of the application is not that big, so I actually need to know what, just what you can clarify exactly. Oh, Your Worship, uh, I understand this motion would be such that if any... Sorry, your work, what, what is actually, people are objecting to your decision. It oh, just characterize it say no information provided to focus. Right, the application to the commissioner's office was to request the commissioner to consider an order to limit the number of requests from Focus Magazine to one request at a time, as opposed to having multiple uh, requests in their act at one time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's an important distinction. Thank you. Thanks for your insight. Yeah, I uh, support this uh, motion strongly. Um, I sent it to the former Information Privacy Commissioner, David Flaherty, and he responded today saying that from a policy perspective, the solution you are advancing makes sense to me and will certainly require City Council to focus on a perceived problem. You might wish to consider to make this resolution retroactive to cover the current situation. Now, I think in light of the bylaws that currently exist and staff's powers that's currently delegated, I don't favor moving as far as Mr. Flaherty is proposing. So I think the motion on the table is sufficient, and I don't, I don't think we need a retroactivity clause. But it just goes to show that the former commissioner who oversaw hundreds of FOI applications and is intimately familiar with FOI and Section 43 as the first commissioner under the Act is actually suggesting that council may want to weigh into the current frame. But I think it's appropriate in terms 
of staff and council relations, I think the most appropriate action <coughs> is to sort of adopt a best practice moving forward and to make this change that for any future Section 43 applications, council itself will be the head while leaving all other day-to-day -day administrative aspects of the Act in the hands of staff as currently provided for in the Bible. Thank you. Any other speakers at this time? Nobody wants to be seen if you say no to this doing. Let me say this. I completely applaud the intent behind this work because I think that were I unfortunately in the position of being the authority to make such decisions, I would not have proceeded in this manner. However, having said that, I think that historically the integrity of the FOI process has rested almost entirely in the belief and the perception and the reality that it is absolutely isolated from political interference or from the opportunity for elected people to pick and choose. And recently on the radio on this, I made a joke with uh, one of our local radio announcers suggesting that perhaps if I preferred their station over another, that would be such a bad thing. And a comment with which he agreed, perhaps for one The reality that for this, uh, in this for me, that I see here an opportunity for us to do exactly what FOI was intended not to happen. Whether it's for the best of intentions, whether it's because I believe I have a weight on my side, I should not have the authority or the opportunity to at all interfere with the process that has been laid out by the provincial government to protect freedom of information. I would not have proceeded as Mr. Woodland has done. Having said that, I absolutely defend the right to do so. It is his job. I think that what the council has done recently in proceeding with its priority designation of open government and open data provisions will eventually reduce, if not eliminate, the need for FOI to be accorded towards any city information. I understand that because we are looking at limited resources, that that will take several years to accomplish to the degree that I think is necessary in order to eliminate the need for FOI. Nevertheless, I believe that we are headed down that path, and I think it's a good one, and I think we are taking steps appropriately. If, in fact, it is a situation that we're facing now which is based on a lack of adequate resources, I believe that is the issue that we should address. And that despite the fact that we are looking at extraordinarily difficult budgetary times, that if, in fact, our obligation, our obligation to provide information about every aspect of the city's operation in a timely and efficient way, that is being hampered by a lack of staff, by a lack of resources, that we have an obligation to redress that issue, despite the fact that it will fly in the face of all of our attempt to reduce our budget. I would therefore be quite prepared to ask in our budgetary capacity and discussions that are unfolding the next six to eight weeks that we in fact prioritize resources for legislative services to deal specifically with applications of FOI, at least in the short term. And in the short term, for that means, that means in my head, at least for the next that means we're going to have to make additionally difficult decisions, just as we saw uh, this morning in our police presentation, and that's what we're going to be faced with over the next few months. But I believe that FOI is an absolutely integral portion of open government, and it is an obligation that we can neither shirk nor interfere with. And if the issue is resources, then that is the issue we need to address. It is not the issue of placing ourselves as elected people in positions of interfering with a public process which must be seen to be different and independent and isolated of our ability to interfere. We must not go down this road. I would urge us to urge our legislative services director to make a specific request for additional resources in our budgetary discussions immediately and for us to look favorably upon that request so that we can, in fact, meet our obligations in dealing with FOI. We must meet those obligations, and if we need to throw money at it, that's what we need to do. In the meantime, we can also look making those uh, particular processes more efficient. It's uncertain an area where we could streamline the steps that need to unfold in order to meet the obligations of preparing that information. I'm certain that over the next year, we can find a way to make the, the process faster and more efficient and more timely and more able to meet the obligations that we need to meet. But in order to make sure that we do that in the right way and not as a one-off, we need time to look at the systems as we're looking at all of our systems find the efficiencies that we all want to accomplish. 
Meanwhile, hire more staff. Do it faster. Bite the bullet. This is what we have an obligation to do. Meanwhile, we advance our open government agenda. We implement the mechanics of open data. We find ways to streamline the processes to deal with FOI, and we do the job better. But in the end, when I listen to comments about council will have the opportunity, references to political ramifications, if we don't do this, that is exactly the reason why we must not do this. We cannot engage in something that has political ramifications to the extent that we are undermining the very purpose of FOI. I urge us not to adopt this motion, but I also urge us to do the other steps that we can do and should do to meet the obligations that we must meet as arbiters of freedom of information to the city. We can do that. We can do that without interfering, and we must do that. And I would be prepared to bring other motions forward to enable that legislation to be, that legislative capacity to be enhanced, despite the fact that it will fly in the face of our, of our desire to limit our budget. This is an area where we can limit our budget. This is an area where we must spend what is necessary. And that, in my view, is the way for us to make sure that we do respect FOI, but that we meet our obligations to allow every person to see the operation of government in each way. Councillor Madoff. Thank you, and, and thank you very much to Councillor Alto for her extremely well considered and thoughtful comments. For me, in reviewing this issue, what was most important to me was the integrity and the independence of the FOI process. Captured that extremely well. Um, I think, you know, simply speaking for myself, yes, it's been very uncomfortable. Well, the, the, the recent scrutiny that this uh, situation has, has put us through or that we've gone through. And my concern was that the temptation would be uh, to relieve the short term pain that we might take an action that would, in my opinion, um, taint the process of FOI. And for all the reasons that Councillor Holton has outlined, in my view, it is of critical importance that it be absolutely separate from any kind of political interference, even that, that, that might be characterized as positive, even for those who might think there's an opportunity to, to provide more rather than less. I think the systemic approach um, is much more appropriate uh, in terms of the, the motions that uh, Councillor Alto has uh, identified that she'd be willing to bring forward uh, to the public. For, for, you know, for, in, in for our consideration, if it's a question of resource, <coughs> then that's something that we have to deal with. And I certainly understand that the situation that we're dealing with the budget, looking at uh, cutting in all different areas, but I think we'll have to make that decision about where is the, uh, in the short term, at least, what are the priorities that we need to achieve while we work further and further on the um, opportunities for open government. Um, I just think that as elected officials, we have to be more than arm's length and that from the FOI process. And although it might uh, read well in the short term, to me, it just speaks to the kind of political interference that I'm not, um, I'm not willing to support. I certainly would be willing to support the conversations around how to expedite the process, how to make the information more readily available, and over time, as our open government and our indeed the information that's posted on our website improve, that's going to go a long way to support that as well. But for me, as I have wrestled with this, I'm not looking for a short-term solution that might help me sleep better at night for the next week. I'm looking for long-term solutions that will improve the situation and not impact the integrity of the medical life process, which I think was designed in a way it's designed in a very particular way. And like uh, uh, Councillor Helps, I certainly did the research of other jurisdictions to find out the uh, examples of delegation of authority, and from what I could find, it was 100%, except in tiny jurisdictions where they've never had an FOI request and they've never actually put a process in place. So I think we're in a good position in terms of having delegated that authority, and I think it's very important that we maintain the integrity of the FOI process and then show our commitment to c continuing the uh, availability of Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and this is a difficult conversation for all of us. And yes, I've had lots of emails, um, not always infused with correct information. And that colors the way the uh, presentations come forward to some of those emails. Um, like Councillor Madoff, I would like to thank Councillor 
are also for a very well read reasoned uh, perspective. I think the motion is presented with the best of intention. The problem is the system it then creates, because we have, at the moment, uh, delegated to staff to make sure it's an arm's length from us. If we then infuse ourselves back into the system as a, an appeal process, basically, everything that is, for one reason or another, denied at this level will come forward to us, and everything will become appealable and therefore politicized. Um, and I know that that's not the intent, but that's quite often the practical implication of this. Um, so we end up battling it as a public political issue, and that's not where I wish to go. Um, I think there are lots of things we can do, and they've been articulated by both Councillors Madoff and, and Alto, in terms of speeding up the process, putting more resources to this issue, because I think it is critically important. But as soon as we become the people who hold the key, we get tainted with any decision, and that's the problem, and that's, that's what we're facing now. We're, we're uncomfortable with what's happening. That said, I look at some of the issues that our planning officer has signed off on because that's a statutorily delegated responsibility that we're not allowed to interfere with. And I've always defended that person's right to make those decisions. Um, we've done it in other cases. And I've, I've thought about it in the past with some issues that have been made by juries we put forward on public art. And I've always defended, while I haven't always agreed with their decisions, I've always defended that delegated authority because it becomes political if it's at this table. So I'm quite willing to uh, support the system that we have at the moment, and I recognize that that will get some of us in hot water. But I do think politicizing the issue is what happens if we uh, follow this motion to become the head of authority. So I won't follow it. Thank you. Uh, for me, and in judging, and it helps uh, for myself. I may or may not agree with the decision that was made by our, our officer, but I recognize that the system was designed to ensure that there wasn't political interference. And I think, <coughs> somewhat ironically, the first time we have a political issue, we have, run, we have begun to start to want to politically interfere. Again, with the best of intentions. I recognize that the process is about sending it to a review by an independent officer of the legislature. And perhaps the question I would ask for you to ask Councillor Isaac, would he appreciate that all of his decisions much actually go through and be reviewed by the legislature or perhaps even worse uh, by the city party? And I suspect that Mr. Flair would say, no, I need to be an independent officer of that. I recognize that this moves through, again, the system that we set up, because it is a litigation system, would then be in camera. And maybe not this council, but perhaps the next one. Uh, the issue is we can make decisions in camera uh, on regarding uh, things that it would be political in nature, and we can make those choices. I think, again, this is one of the ones where we must stand up and defend the process, not the actual thing, and recognize just that is important to uphold and recognize and move forward to arbitration, or sorry, move forward to mediation, move forward to review by independent officer of the legislature. I agree, taking a look at how we can in, uh, provide more resources is really important as we move forward to our uh, issue around open government and making it more human uh, for people to access stuff. I think, truly, I don't think it's going to reduce the amount of FOI requests, no matter how much information uh, we put out because the information is always, I don't care how much public information you put out, I want to know what you're not going to know. Having said that, for the majority of our citizens, for, for the ease of business and all those sort of issues, open government, open data is something that is just where we're going in society. So for all the fantastic reasons that have been articulated by Cancer Altos and others, I reluctantly cannot support this, even though recognizing it's brought forward in the present day. The next new speaker is Councillor Gudgeon, and then Councillor Helps for the second time. Um, I will be supporting this motion. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, thank you Councillor Isaac for giving Mr. Flair these comments. And also, I, we keep talking open data, open government. 
I don't see it. So we can talk it, and it sounds great, but quite frankly, we're using that as a language without following it up with the action. And I just, it, it, and I'm seeing that over and over in my limited experience at this council table. It sounds great, but I'm not actually see it. And this is another case in point where we're not being transparent enough, especially to the media outlet. I mean, we need, we've got nothing to hide. We should be sharing it, giving it to them. I don't think their requests have been to my, and I know there's different information that we're talking about, but I want to be careful and not say the wrong thing, but I don't think their requests have been onerous. Thank you. Uh, a new speaker, if you do wish, thank you, is uh, Councillor Thornton Joe, and then Councillor Elson. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate um, Councillor Elson and Isaac bringing this motion forward, and, and uh, my colleagues for their comments. And, I think when I first received it, I could support it uh, because I think it was brought forward in, in uh, the best intent and, and considering the situation uh, that uh, has come forward. Uh, I, you know, I understand uh, Councillor Edgen's concern about uh, uh, whether we're being transparent enough and, and whether we have done enough for what the data is concerned. Uh, and I think we have a long way to go before I think we're really committing the, the public are satisfied. <coughs> That being said, that's not what I, we're looking at today. We're looking at uh, the use of FOIs. And because of that, after hearing Councillor Alta speak, I think uh, her, her rationale um, and the comments she made uh, for the reasons why FOIs are there and, and the things are in place to keep from having public, to have uh, uh, our, our interference. I, I'm going to be not supporting the motion on the table, but I uh, agree with uh, my colleagues at the Council of Elders. I think it's wrong. I mean, we will hear from Councillor Helps. Sure. So I just I appreciate all the comments and all the discussion around the table. I just want to be really clear this motion is very specific. It's inserting Council's discretionary decision making power into one very small section of the Act. So I have a question for Mr. Woodland. How many times since the Act was passed in 1992 has the City of Victoria made a Section 43 request? I believe this is the first time. Thank you. So we're not talking political interference at every turn, every dark corner. We're talking about one time in the last 20 years where Council and a Council of the Future could have some <coughs> discretion. I'm not talking about micromanaging. I'm not talking about second guessing. I am talking about extreme circumstances, and one time in 20 years is an extreme circumstance, when council can have information and make a decision about a very important public process. I've heard the words repeatedly, political interference in a public process. We are the publicly elected officials of this local government, and we're not talking about getting down into the depths and administering the act. We're talking about significant moments, and particularly when it comes to the press, significant moments that we, as a public body, involved in a very public process, need to take responsibility for. Thank you. Anybody else at this time? Seeing that on the motion, all those in favor? Yeah, I did. All those opposed? Burn Joe, Coleman, Matt, Off, Gordon, Paul. Councillor Alton. I would just like to provide notice of motion of my intent to return to the next GPC uh, meeting with two motions. One of which will specifically address the uh, requirement to provide additional secretarial resources in the form of at least one additional staff person to be allocated to the legislative services specifically to process FOI requests. Balance of 2012 and 2013, and a second motion which will move that the process currently being used by the city to process FOI be reviewed uh, with an eye to increasing its efficiency and timeliness. I would second those and counsel by unanimous. No, 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 no. I know, but we're always having two people second those things just because they bring it forward. Counsel, we can waive the requirement for notice of motion and actually accept that motion unanimously. If you wish to do that, otherwise, we'll just see it as Motions you have to now, we can do that. 
If you want to see them in print, we can wait two weeks. In print, thank you. I'll find an officer. Next item is sharing. Councilor Gorgio. Uh, just with Lady Borgia, many of us on Tuesday were at the uh, Victoria Foundation's uh, Bioscience Breakfast. And uh, once again, I just always appreciate being there and getting uh, input from the citizens of what they love about the Federal Capital Region and what concerns. So um, I just brought extra copies for me and uh, my colleagues who were there to make it. So I always think it's important and often. I think it's one of the, I think that's our bad off uh, comment that often we use these as some of our decision making, uh, whether it's planning land use or um, grants or any other uh, you know, issue that can start to So once again, just a great breakfast of information. Next item is the Council Report. Biological response. 